thank you for that introduction. Before I even start talking, I have to say that I felt so profoundly the loss to this country and to myself of a friend watching that video. I, I didn't think it would be so, as emotional as it was because it, it just brought so clearly to me what this country has lost, what I've always known about Lot. Um, it's, it's just in that video reminded me of all of those qualities. And I will tell you also one thing. I used to tease him and say, what do you use to comb your hair? <laughs> because if you know Lot, there isn't a single hair out of place. It, 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 it was amazing. And I would say to him, I'd love to see you comb, because it must be so thorough, <laughs> the combing. So thank you very much for that. Let me just say, before I acknowledge all the um, important people that are here, that this is probably the first time in my life that I have ever written a speech. Other than the speeches that were written for me by Sassol to make sure that I said the right thing and I didn't <laughs> offend, and, and I didn't get the shares tumbling down or speak the shares up too much because I can actually speak a share price up if I, if I want to. Um, but I felt this was so important, um, the lecture today, that I actually felt this is one of those occasions that you know, I cannot ad lib. And I can speak. They used to say to me at Cecil, Chair, we can wake you up at 12 midnight and you could make a speech, because I can. But this is one occasion that I didn't, I felt I didn't want to ad lib. I actually wanted to read a speech. And one of the reasons I never write, read speeches is I find that I get so obsessed with counting the pages. When someone has a speech written down, and I'm thinking, OK, one more page. <laughs> to, so don't you dare count my pages today. Let me start by acknowledging, first of all, Mrs. Zanel and Loven, the Loven family. Professor Wiseman Ngushu and Mrs. Ngushu, chairman of the uh, Maduke Lodendrovu Legacy Trust, and all the trustees who are here, our host, Mr. Sandy Lekwala, and all the people from Deloitte, the board of the Black Management Forum, <coughs> and all of you as our honored guests, because I wouldn't be making this speech if there were none of you here. I have to say, Sandile, after listening to you and watching that video, that's why I said exactly, because I thought, why, why do I need to speak after this? <laughs> it's all been said, and it's, and, and it's been amazing. But I do speak because I'm very passionate about leadership, and I really do believe that we need to address issues of leadership in this country. If ever there was a time that the world needed good leaders, it is now. If ever there was a time the developing world needed good leaders, it is now. If ever there was a time South Africa needed good leaders, it is now. But if you ask me, do we have enough good leaders to go around, to run our countries, our companies, our governments, and our civil society organizations, the answer to that would probably be yes if all we're looking for are people capable enough to take up leadership positions. But if we were looking for leaders who embody old-fashioned values of leadership, some of the values that we heard Lord talk about in the video, namely integrity, honesty, transparency, and humility, then your guess would be as good as mine. So what are the leadership imperatives for the world we live in today? First of all, let me take you back to the world of yesteryear. And I'm going to go back in years to circa 1970, where a leadership position meant that you were actually lord of the manor. You were a law unto yourself. You sat in an ivory tower, and people kind of tiptoed quietly around you. You were basically accountable to no one but yourself. You spoke 
and didn't listen much because after all, your word was final. You led from the front and expected everyone to just follow you. And if any of the followers stepped out of line or even tried to overtake you, you could simply fire them. I'm generalizing, of course, because there were, even during those times, leaders who were way ahead of their time. Leaders who had EQ, emotional intelligence. The point I'm making is this. Traditional leadership practices are failing, and organizations, businesses, and even countries are the ones that are paying the price. And yet, sadly, remnants of those practices still remain despite the problems they create. The reasons for the failures in leadership that have become so common are abundantly clear. We have forgotten our purpose as leaders. We have become power hungry as leaders. We have allowed our ethics to slip. We have become oh so arrogant and greedy. And we seek replicas of ourselves to promote or to delegate to. Now step back 40 years later to the world we live in now, which is a much different place than the world of the 70s, where the leader sat in an ivory tower and could do no wrong and didn't have to listen to anyone. Today's world demands a very different kind of leadership. And so today's leaders actually have to keep up with the fast pace of change. They have to be of good character. Today's leaders are expected to set the right tone at the top. A leader is now expected to do things right, not just to be discreet. Because there was a time when people would say to leaders, just be discreet. And in other words, almost quietly encouraging them to do what they want, as long as you were discreet and people didn't find out what you were doing. That word, at any rate, the word discreet, flew out the window with the advent of social media. Today, leaders are expected to be accountable to a wide range of stakeholders. And so transparency has become a leadership imperative. When I joined boards about 25 years ago, and I had to laugh, Sandile, when you said this old person, that's why Prof and I were laughing, 60 something of that. <laughs> You know, I guess we are old people now. <laughs> but when I joined boards about 21, 25 years ago, if things went wrong, the concern would have been if this gets out. A modern board today says we need to manage communications on the issue. That we need to tell people that something wrong has happened is now a given. The only question is how to do it so as to manage the fallout and minimize damage to the company or organization or the country. The reason this is happening is not because there are different laws or because King or the JSE rules say it needs to be done this way. It happens because today's leaders understand the currency that is reputation and Lord himself mentioned reputation. They understand the currency that is reputation so much better now. No one wants to be associated with the cover-up. But better still, everyone understands how a cover-up, once outed, will erode people's confidence in the leadership of a company, the state, or the organization. And outed it will be. We are in the middle of a digital revolution, and only a dumb leader wonders how information got out. So let me just share some statistics with you on this digital revolution. Over 300 hours of video are uploaded every minute on YouTube. 300 hours of video uploaded every minute on YouTube. Internet users tripled in a decade to approximately 3.2 billion people. This is half the population of the world. And you have to see this in real time to appreciate it. When I was on the board of Unilever PLC, and 
you know, I, I say was because I retired last year from that board, because in the UK you can only serve three terms of three years each. It's not like King that says you can go on for 14 years as long as people still consider you independent. In the United Kingdom, it is three terms of three years each, nine years you're out. And so my term, having joined the board of Unilever PLC in 2007, ended last year in 2016. But I had a privilege before I retired because of Unilever's power, I guess, to have access to spend a week in Silicon Valley in the offices of Twitter, Facebook, and Google. And when I talk about a digital revolution, you honestly have to see it in real time. Because I sat in a, in a boardroom at Twitter and there was a screen as big as this. And I don't think I heard much of what they were telling us because my eyes were glued on the screen because you were just seeing people around the world, billions and billions of people on internet, on social media, on everything in real time. You were watching this digital revolution that people speak about actually happening in real time. And they actually say the email has become obsolete and the millennials are spending more time now on Skype, on WhatsApp, on WeChat, which means if you as a leader even step out of uh, the, right, the right place or say something wrong, it is instantly, instantly on media. It's the days of I'm going to go back to the office and write an email and send it to a journalist or my friends are over. People can actually out you in seconds. If Sandile had said something wrong now, now, that hashtag would have picked it up in minutes. When I did my show on CNBC Africa on, on leadership, I would be amazed. I would finish recording the show, and I see Xavier is here. He was one of my guests on those. I would finish the show, and I would be amazed that I was recording, and by the time I get out, what is on social media is unbelievable. What was said during that, pictures of being on set and what was happening on set already out. So the days of people thinking they can sweep things under the carpet are gone and finished. So what does that say about how we should lead in this VUCA world? And, and I hope everybody's familiar with the word VUCA. But the term VUCA was termed to describe a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. What it simply means is that we can no longer lead from the front nor from the back. We need to walk alongside people we are leading right in the center. And if you can, walk sideways so that you constantly have your eyes on everyone. You need to be watching everyone that you work with and every member because you need to be encouraging, cajoling, and sometimes even corralling them onto the right path. This means that there will be some who walk ahead of the leader. A good leader who understands the power of harnessing a team's strengths will encourage and allow that to happen. He or she will not be threatened. They will shout out encouragement to the front team showing confidence in their ability to navigate, sometimes warning them of pitfalls to look out for, and occasionally even asking, what do you see yonder, as the teams discover new frontiers. He might occasionally have to run to catch up with the team ahead and have them walk him through their new discoveries. Today's leader finds time to chat to the teams walking in the middle and the center, <coughs> side by side with him. He catches up on what their challenges have been and what their dreams are. He or she encourages them to walk faster and catch up with the front team and brings them up to speed with developments in the front line. He or she inspires them to want to walk faster and be part of the discovery team in the front. A good leader constantly glances back at those who have fallen behind. He stops to encourage them to soldier on, no matter how hard. He points to those who were in the middle team who have now joined the front team. 
And so he picks up his pace again, taking forward into the medal team, some who were energized by his presence, his guidance, and the need to step a little bit forward. If strong, collaborative, responsible leadership was needed anywhere in the world today, it would be in the developing world, because we are the future, and we cannot afford to get it wrong. There is simply no time to waste, and we have been overtaken by events. The world is moving east and south faster than we can say move. South Africa needs leaders in government, in business, in SOEs, in civil society, and all other spheres who can speak truth to power, who do not close rank on issues, but concentrate on the principles. Leaders such as Rural Koza, Lot Ndrovu, and many others. And I remember, as people say, Lot and I chat the, the <coughs> title of, of deputy chairman at NetBank and, and sat together. And I remember one particular decision that the board had to take at some point, and I will not discuss the detail of that because it's confidential. But it was one of those issues that Prof actually spoke about, which can be decisive, divisive to a board. And I remember that I stood alone on a particular issue. And all other members of the board of all races were at Eden on that issue. And I stood alone on the basis of a principle. I was overruled because that's how the system works. And I welcome that. And as board members, and that, that, this is what brings our SOEs down, when you are outvoted, you do not run to the minister or the shareholder. You accept that you have been outvoted by your peers who have discussed and have put their points stronger than you did. And so I lost my fight, but I had been standing alone on that issue. And that evening, I got a call from Lot, who said to me, I admire you for the stance that you took. Didn't agree with you, I still don't agree with you, but I admire that you were able to stand up against all of us and tell us why you disagreed and why you couldn't vote for that particular motion. And that really had an impact on me because what it said was that this is a man who understands that we cannot decide issues on the basis of closing ranks, either on the basis of color or creed or gender, but that we have to talk and stand on issues of principle. Now, I spoke about how important it is for us to stand up as the developing world and how important the developing world is. And I just want to share some statistics with you. The BRICS nations, for instance, have 40% of the world's population, 4-0. They account for 20% of global GDP. They have 50% of the global workforce is in the BRICS nations. And most importantly, they control over 40% of the world's forest, forest <laughs> reserves. So this brings me back home now to the role that black leadership has played in coming out and influencing the outcomes of transformation and the development of leadership talent. I would be in total, total denial if I pretended that business in South Africa has not had to be nudged, cajoled, and sometimes even kicked in the butt to embrace transformation in its widest construct. In other words, introducing more gender, more color and skills diversity and inclusivity into the workplace, confronting behaviors that are a barrier to black excellence, finding sustainable ways of doing business that are driven by a purpose higher than the mere pursuit of profits. Organizations such as the Black Management Forum have been at the forefront of this push. And Lot Ndlovu, whom we honor tonight, was amongst those leading the charge. This has led to women and Africans being prioritized for promotion and fully able but physically challenged people having space carved out for them. Through the efforts of these organizations and leaders, aided by legislation, 
putting women and people of color in key strategic positions has become commonplace. That we have to celebrate and to be proud of. But we still have a long way to go and collaboration and building alliances between leaders of government, business, civil and professional organizations will be of paramount importance. However, sometimes the aggressiveness and zeal with which the transformation agenda was followed has led to unintended consequences which have served to feed stereotypes already held about the very people that transformation was meant to benefit. Businesses, sometimes in their haste to meet quotas and please government and organizations driving transformation, have looked for quick wins and sometimes even sacrificing key issues of meritocracy. This has led to people being promoted into positions they were not ready to handle yet, thereby leading to their dismal failure and the perpetuation of the stereotype that Africans and all women are incapable of leading. But by far the worst unintended consequence has been how highly capable individuals promoted purely on merit have been robbed of the ability to enjoy their victory as they were seen purely as token appointments. And I remember being on the receiving end of that when I was also appointed deputy chairman of Lead Bank. And I had one of the colleagues of color, as, as Lot was referring to, saying to me, isn't it nice to be a woman? <laughs> <laughs> so I said to him, if it helps you sleep better at night, to think of it that way, go for it. <laughs> and in his case, it didn't only help him sleep better at night, but it helped him sleep better if it helped him sleep better during board meetings. Because <laughs> what he didn't acknowledge was that he spent half the board meeting dozing off and sleeping. But still, instead of acknowledging the meritocracy that went into that promotion, he had to throw in, isn't it nice? to be a black woman. And so some of those unintended consequences come back to bite me. That for me has been the saddest consequence of the combative nature of the narrative on transformation. I know for a fact that this is not what the pioneers of transformation had in mind. This is not only detrimental to the people in those positions, but also to the organizations they have to take leadership positions in. South African leaders have to come to a common understanding of what leadership qualities we're seeking in order to build stronger organizations for the benefit of our country and our economy. David Ogilvy, who was the founder of Ogilvy and Metha, once said, if we continue hiring people who are smaller than we are, we shall become a company of dwarfs. But if each of us hires people who are bigger than we are, we shall become a company of giants. And I want you to read country for company, and the sentiment is still true. Consistently hiring people who are smarter than us may well be the greatest legacy we leave this country. Leaders have the responsibility to consistently set the bar higher if we want to see our country become a giant. I read somewhere a quote made by the very man that we honor today, Dr. Lawton Lowe. He said in our quote, those who have their hands on the levers of power should tremble each time they make decisions for what they do now will eventually affect the community out there. How very true and profound. But the good news is that all is not lost. As long as we have leaders who look back, who introspect, who learn from their mistakes, this country will be okay. This economy will be okay. This developing world will be okay. And I'm reminded of a joke that my brother, 
tells over and over again, and he's in his 60s now, so you understand that this joke keeps coming. <laughs> but he is my big brother, and I defer to him, so if he thinks the joke is good enough to tell over and over again, I've told it many times when I speak, and you're gonna hear it again. But he tells the story to his children, our children, to illustrate how important it is to learn from your mistakes. And he went to Orlando High. And he remembers having a teacher who would, at the end of every test as he was handing out the script, would say to each and every one of them, I want you to stand up and tell the class what mark you got and what you did wrong. So Sandila would get up and say, well, you know, I got 70, and you know, this is what I did right. Hexonia would get up and say, I got 50, and this is what I got wrong. But this guy, who we will call Sipu, because he might still be alive. <laughs> <laughs> he got up and he said, and apparently his biggest problem was he didn't know the past participle of the word put. And so he said, well, say I got 40%. And the teacher said, tell the class why you got 40%. And he said, because say, I've, I've put and put in where I should have put and put. <laughs> and, and clearly, if he had learned from his mistake, he would have said, I've put put in where I should have put put. <laughs> but, but my brother always tells the story of, of Sipan saying, I've put in, put in, where I should have put in, put. <laughs> to illustrate that unless you learn from your mistakes, you will never overcome them. So I'm going to close off by talking about the importance of introspection and us looking back and tell you about a concept called the overview effect. And this concept was coined by astronauts, actually, after they came back from the moon. And they talk about the most profound experience and the most profound thing that could happen to a human being. And that is the first time that they see our planet hanging in space. And they talk about how very often they spend hours and hours doing what they call earth gazing. And, and so they came back to Earth and spoke to philosophers and said, it's almost religious and spiritual when you see the planet for the first time, because you've now exited and you see our planet, Earth, actually dangling, and you understand that we are actually in space. And they called it the overview effect because the effect that it has is, is it gives you a new perspective on this planet in which we live, because you've now left it, and you're able to look back and glance back at this planet. And they talk about how the effect of seeing the sun in a black sky. We see the sun against a blue sky. They see the sun against a black sky. They experience the sun as a star, because it's against a black sky. And these astronauts talk about how, because they are rotating like this, every two minutes, they're seeing the sun, they're seeing the moon, and, and all the different planets. And they talk about the, the profound effect that you have from seeing the Earth that is our home. For the first time, seeing the storms below you, seeing the lightning behind you, seeing the aurora and the beauty, and how every so often you see this earth and this planet come alive as the cities light up around the globe. And the fact that they can come out of this place which they think they understand and know so intimately and be able to see it in its beauty and appreciate its beauty for the first time, but also see all the devastation that we as humans have caused on the planet. But more importantly, being able to glance back at this planet, which is their home, and see just the thin layer of blue 
that protects us from death. And they understand for the first time the devastation of climate change and all the things that we talk about only from a philosophical level. But they are able to see it first thing. They see the, the deforestation as clearly as, 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 as if they were on this. The point I'm making about the overview effect is the astronauts have learned how important it was to actually step out of ourselves to glance back and look back and to see and learn from what we are doing. And so as leaders, we need a little bit of that overview effect. And I will just close off by saying one of the most profound things they said is they said we were so focused on going to the moon and reaching the moon that we actually didn't realize it was only when we saw our planet dangling in space and saw everything, the new perspective that it gave us, that going to the moon, that seeing ourselves and seeing our planet from outside of it may well have been the main purpose for the trip to the moon. I hope we will all as leaders learn to introspect, learn to look back, learn to take that overview effect into the decisions that we make and into the way that we lead this country and the people, particularly those who follow us. Thank you.